So our next speaker is um, Ali Reza Katai, and he'll be presenting a paper called Approximate Hybrid Binary Ur Unary Computing with Applications in Birth Language Model and Image Processing. Um, you can load up the slides uh, while I'm introducing you. So, so Ali Reza um, received his, bat his BS degree in electrical engineering from Amir Akbar University of Technology, Tehran Polytechnic in Tehran, Iran in 2021. He is currently a graduate student with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. His current research focuses on hardware accelerator design for compute intensive applications using approximate and unary computing. So just to Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello everyone, this is Ali Reza Khatai uh, from the University of Minnesota. Uh, and I'm honored to present our research project on approximate hybrid binary unary computing uh, with applications in birth language model and image process. Uh, first of all, I will briefly talk about the previous works, including fully unary and exact HPU. Uh, then I will introduce our proposed work, uh, followed by the experimental results of uh, implementing nonlinear functions and uh, nonlinear layers of BERT language model and Robert Cross detection algorithm. Uh, finally, we have conclusion and question answering part. Okay, uh, fully unir is a method that was proposed in 2018 uh, as an alternative to uh, conventional binary and uh, a stochastic computing method, uh, it implements function using wires and XOR gates, uh, and it works on thermometer codes, which is a representation of numbers uh, in hardware. Uh, for example, if you want to represent five in this method, uh, you will put uh, five ones and the rest are zeros. And uh, the total length of this stream depends on the maximum value that you want to represent in a system. Uh, here you can see the architecture of the method. Uh, it consists of encoders and decoders, uh, which converts numbers from binary to unary and vice versa. And uh, the most important part of this architecture is uh, unary core, which transforms uh, the input unary to output. Uh, let's say we have a lookup table uh, in this way. Uh, this is the input and this is the output. Uh, okay, this is the input and this is the output and you can see the shape of the uh, function by looking at the output values. Uh, and the values are already converted to unary. So to, uh, to map the input to output, we need wires and XOR gates to do that, and this network here uh, does this. Uh, for now, uh, just ignore the XOR gates and uh, consider them as continuous wires. Uh, when the input is zero, this is input and this is output. Uh, the X axis is input and the Y axis is output. And uh, when the input is zero, the output is two. And uh, these two bits are always connected to VDD to represent one, uh, to represent uh, one in the system. So if I increase the input and when the input is one, uh, the output, uh, one output bit is triggered and the total value of the output becomes uh, three. Uh, so if I increase the input, uh, uh, gradually the output increases uh, accordingly uh, until uh, I reach this point. Uh, as you can see, this function is non monotonically increasing function. So some output bits need to uh, need to be re-triggered after they are uh, triggered. So we need to set them off. So we need to use XOR gates here. Uh, and you can see that if uh, if I increase the input uh, when when and when it is six, uh, the output becomes uh, eleven. And yeah, you can see that when it is uh, five, it's 12, and when it is six, uh, the output is uh, 11. Uh, although the complexity of the unary core uh, in fully unary method is trivial, 
uh, this method is not scalable because uh, if you have a W bit uh, binary number to represent the unary code, you need uh, to have a two to the power of W bits uh, to represent that values. And uh, the other thing is that uh, this method has encoders and decoders uh, which are complex at higher resolutions, which make the whole architecture unattractive to designers. Uh, Exact HPU was proposed in 2019 as an alternative to fully unary. Uh, it breaks the function into several subfunctions, as you can see. Uh, and for example, if the original function is from 0 to 256, uh, it breaks the function into chunks uh, with limited interval. So we can use uh, less complex encoders to encode the input values. And uh, it, also separates, it also separates the initial bias of each of these subfunctions. Uh, for example, the bias of this, uh, the, the second subfunction is around 18. And this is the minimum value in this range. And by separating these uh, initial biases, we can have, uh, we can limit the output ranges, as you can see in this figure. Um, so uh, we, uh, we can also use less complex, uh, less complex decoders as well. So this is the architecture of exact HPU. Uh, you can see that the lower bits of the input binary are used to perform the computations of uh, the subfunctions in unary. And after the computations are done, uh, we need to use the upper bits of the input binary to multiple extent because we are computing all the subfunctions at the same time and one of them holds the uh, correct value. Uh, we also need to uh, multiplex the biases uh, and the biases are shown in this figure. Uh, and a binary adder adds these two values together to uh, generate the output. Uh, here you can see the comparison of fully unary and exact HPU for some uh, functions uh, at 8 bit resolution. Uh, for example, for exponential function, uh, fully unary uses uh, 17 LUTs, but uh, exact HPU uses 28 LUTs. Uh, our method is based on uh, exact HPU, but uh, it performs some approximation to eliminate the need of uh, binary adder here and uh, we don't need to use any biases. Uh, so we can reduce the critical pass delay and we can reduce the area complexity. And it is based on uh, the idea of concatenation instead of separating the initial biases. Uh, for example, if we have a function like this, uh, which is split into two parts, uh, the first part, the first upper bit of the first part is uh, always zero. And the first upper bit of the second part is always one. Uh, so for computing this function, we don't need uh, to compute the first upper bit. We can eliminate this first upper bit for now and compute the other bits using a uh, unary course. And after the computations are done, we can concatenate those upper bits uh, to the values. By doing so, we can reduce, uh, we can reduce the output lengths and we can use less complex uh, decoders and encoders. Uh, at the same time, we don't need to use uh, any biases and we don't need to use any adders. Uh, but this example was a general one. Uh, wasn't a general one uh, because uh, fortunately uh, it crosses this point. But if we have a function which is uh, more general, uh, here you can see that uh, if we split this into two parts, uh, in F2, uh, we don't have any problem because the first upper bit is always one. So we don't need to touch this part, but uh, in F1, as you can see, the first upper bit is changing from zero to one. Uh, so we have a problem here and we need to do some approximation to make this uh, first upper bit fixed. Uh, so we have two options for the approximations. Uh, to make it zero or to make it one. We can project the uh, top part so that, sorry, uh, so that uh, the first upper bit becomes zero or we can uh, project the bottom part so that the first upper bit becomes one. Uh, for each case, we need to compute uh, the approximation error 
And uh, if the approximation error is less than a given threshold, we keep the changes. Uh, otherwise, we consider the final option. Uh, the final option is to split that subfunction into two further subfunctions, F11 and F12. Uh, here in F12, we don't have the problem anymore uh, because the first upper bit is fixed. And, uh, but in F11, we have the same problem. Uh, but the thing is that uh, if we, sorry, if we apply the approximation error at this time, uh, the approximation error will be smaller uh, compared to the previous time. So we keep continue doing so until the upper bits of all the subfunctions become fixed so that we can uh, separate them uh, before doing computations and concatenating them after the computations are done. Uh, this is the architecture of our method. Uh, the lower bits of the, sub, uh, the input binary are used to perform the computations of approximate subfunctions. And uh, after they are done, uh, we need to concatenate the upper bits uh, with the corresponding output. And uh, the upper bits of the input binary are used to select the correct value. Uh, the next step to reduce the complexity of uh, uh, hardware architecture of our method is to perform a self-similarity measure. Uh, we observe that uh, many of these uh, subfunctions are similar to each other. So we don't need to implement all of them. Uh, and instead we can, for example, implement some of them and derive the other ones from that. Uh, and it can reduce the complexity of hardware dramatically and it can reduce the number of LUTs that are needed for implementing functions. And this is the way we find the similarities between subfunctions. For example, here, uh, we, we can observe that F11 is uh, similar to F12 and we can implement, implement them interchangeably. Uh, let's take a look at the experimental results. Uh, we have implemented these uh, nonlinear functions, uh, GLU, gamma, uh, TANH, and uh, hyperbolic cosine, and exponential functions. Uh, this is the hardware cost results. The y-axis is the logarithm of uh, average area latency cost, and uh, the x-axis is different resolutions, and the colors are different methods. Uh, the blue one here is conventional binary. Uh, the red one is conventional stochastic computing. Uh, the yellow one is exact edge view and uh, purple and uh, green ones uh, are uh, two different configurations of our method. Uh, this is because our method provides a trade-off between accuracy and hardware costs. So we need to use two parameters to different approximation error to show the, this trade-off here. Uh, as an example, uh, here you can see the hardware cost of implementing the nonlinear functions. For example, for exponential function, exact HPU implemented uh, using 28 LUTs, but the first configuration of our method uses four LUTs instead. And the second configuration of our method can implement that for using 14 LUTs. But the second configuration is obviously more accurate than the first configuration. Uh, and in this figure, you can see the accuracy results uh, in terms of absolute error and maximum absolute error. Uh, the first row corresponds to a stochastic method, and the second and third row correspond to uh, two configurations of our method. Uh, the, the first configuration has close, are close to a stochastic computing, uh, but the second configuration is, uh, are more accurate than uh, these two methods. Uh, the next application that we implemented to show the benefits of our method was BERT language model. Uh, it's a transformer-based uh, language model which consists of uh, three nonlinear uh, layers, including softmax, layer norm, and GLU functions. And uh, we use our approximate uh, accelerators to implement softmax and GLU. Uh, this is the architecture of GLU function. Uh, we, we only implement the nonlinear part of uh, this function. And for the outliers, we use comparator to uh, approximate them using lines. And uh, as you can see for the input, uh, 
which is less than uh, minus eight, it, it's equal to zero. And for the input, uh, which are greater than eight, uh, the output equals to input. And this is the architecture of softmax layer. Uh, you can see that uh, we again use our accelerator to perform this computation. Uh, and uh, it, it also has a max layer. We subtract the maximum value from the inputs so to prevent the system from overflowing. And here you can see the accurate, uh, the hardware cost of different methods. Uh, iBERT is an integer only implementation of BERT, which uses integer uh, operations and uh, exact HPU and two configurations of our method. Uh, using the same area, you can see that uh, our method can reduce the number of cycles that it takes to generate the output. And here you see the accuracy results. The y-axis is uh, the percentage of the accuracy. Uh, the colors are uh, different benchmarks and the x-axis are, uh, the x-axis is the different methods uh, like Roberta, Ibert, ExactHPU, and our method. Uh, Roberta is a floating point implementations, and uh, you can see that the second configuration has competitive results to, to the exact implementations. And we also observed that, for example, in QNLI, it can uh, even increase the accuracy as well. Uh, the next application that we implemented was uh, Robert Cross Age Detection Algorithm. Uh, you can see that in terms of PSNR for the accuracy, uh, our method, the second configuration of our method can uh, reach the similar results to the exact implementations and it can reduce the hardware cost by 20% uh, compared to exact HP. And uh, here are the output results for the edge detection algorithm and these two are uh, our methods and this is the floating point implementation. And as a conclusion, we can say that our method uh, can provide a trade-off between uh, hardware cost and accuracy. It can uh, reduce the critical path delay and it can uh, reduce the hardware area as well. Thank you so much for your attention. So we have some time for questions. Um, so. So I have a question uh, about the accuracy results. Um, so did you include any kind of robust training while you are producing those results or was all of the unary conversion done post training? Um, uh, yes, uh, the accuracy result for the BERT implementation was based on uh, in in inference. It doesn't include the training uh, part of the BERT implementation and we only just report that results. Do you think there is an uh, opportunity to kind of improve the accuracy further if you include that in the uh, training? Yes, uh, I think if uh, we can optimize uh, the similarity measure part, uh, I, I think we can uh, improve the accuracy result as well. Uh, Very nice talk. Uh, just a question, Would it, is it possible to create a sort of configurable module that works with this number format that could be configured to implement a variety of different functions. I, I presume for the results that you presented, you create a sort of customized HBU approximate unit for every function that you wanted soft maxed, whatever. Yeah, uh, the thing is that our method works based on uh, the lookup table. And for each function, we have to search uh, am among the uh, search uh, search area that we have to find the optimal one. Uh, and because our method provides a trade-off between accuracy and hardware costs, so we need to do that. For example, in some applications, uh, we can tolerate some errors, so we can uh, use some parameters to generate some, uh, some functions. And for the other applications, we need to use other uh, parameters to uh, generate other uh, functions. Hope that answered your question. Uh, thank you very much. This is a very interesting piece of work, and it's really nice to see that you can approximate those nonlinear functions. Uh, I think my question is 
um, B, you have mentioned this point and I missed it. Do you think the approximation also works equally well to the linear operations or it works extremely good for nonlinears? Uh, it can also um, implement the linear functions like uh, constant coefficient multipliers. Uh, but the thing is that it cannot uh, be used for uh, 2D functions at the moment we are working on that and uh for, for the one d functions we can implement the linear functions as well uh yes so in this application because it has a lot of linear softmax so this is particularly helpful in this case right yeah that, exactly okay. Yeah. okay got it thank you yeah. great uh, thank you for another great talk yes thank you. Uh,